Exactly one year ago, President Bola Tinubu declared a state of emergency on food security in Nigeria and also directed that all matters pertaining to food and water affordability be included within the purview of the National Security Council. The president also directed the immediate release of fertilizers and grains to farmers and households to mitigate the effects of the subsidy removal. One year after the situation did not get better, food prices literally hit the roof and diminished the purchasing power of citizens. Today, at 40.7%, food inflation has reached its highest level in the last 25 years. According to the governor of the central bank, inflationary pressure continues to be driven largely by food inflation. He says factors responsible for the hike in food prices are the rising cost of transportation, especially transporting of farm produce, infrastructure-related constraints within the distribution network, security challenges in some food-producing areas, and the impact of exchange rate fluctuations on the prices of imported food items. But a relentless Bola Tinubu administration now seeks to adopt multi-pronged measures to combat food insecurity with the inauguration of the Presidential Food Systems Coordination Unit to harness resources and ideas. The President is engaging the states, development partners and other critical stakeholders in the ongoing efforts to push down the high food prices. The Governor of Niger State, Mohamed Bago, has also proposed his state to pilot the President's Food Security Initiative. He says his administration has invested more than 100 billion naira in agricultural mechanization with 5,000 tractors and 20 pilot irrigation systems. Well, we'll get um, details from these reports. From flooding, air pollution, wildfires to severe heat waves, this phenomenon occasioned by climate change threatens the very existence of humanity. One of such causes of this degradation is open field burning, where farmers set fire to clear stubble, weeds and waste before planting a new crop. Although this has been an age-long practice, agricultural experts and stakeholders at this workshop describe the practice as highly unsustainable, and here is why. We know that when people burn their farm waste, um, it can cause a lot of uh, health issues and environmental issues. So this project is an 18-month pilot uh, to work with 500 farmers uh, in Boko. But the learnings from this project is going to be uh, across Nigeria. That's why we're having the launch today. We have people from Ministry of Agriculture from all over, from all the six geopolitical zones. Addressing this issue of paramount concern to Nigeria's agricultural ministry and is poised to extend increased support to agencies directly involved in combating open field burning. And we have some of these NGOs and some of these development partners that are willing eh, to partake in some of these activities. And that's why we are having this project here. Because this is being sponsored by the CACC, which is Climate and Clean Air Coalition, eh, which is an organization that is funded by so many countries. When we target the 500, we will target the overall people of uh, Bopo as well through a lot of sensitization. Now the action point is being taken to the field with a planned pilot training of farmers in Benue State on the detrimental effects of short-lived climate pollutants resulting from open field burning. Uh, yeah, they've been uh, in lots of uh, uh, meetings worldwide to think about how to mitigate uh, um, the issues of climate and then uh, to see that uh, greenhouse gas emissions is mitigated and the, the reduction of all these problems. So we are going to be working as a pilot in Benue State and in Boko local government area uh, to start with and we are looking at cascading this knowledge and the learnings to the entire country. This kind of meeting will be valuable for real farmers and can promote the agricultural sector and boost food security if well executed. Uloma Oyemachi, TBC News, Abuja. Well, uh, the governor of Niger State, Mohamed Bago, was supposed to join us on this um, program. We hear uh, he's um, indisposed, unavoidably um, 
absent. He can't join us now. But you know, this um, prevailing food crisis has defied um, all solutions are thrown at it. We're going to ask him why uh, the, government, the government thinks, uh, you know, with the latest inauguration of the presidential food systems coordination unit, this uh, will make any difference. And you also recall that uh, the ONU of IFE has threatened uh, to banish any trader that sells food and other essential commodities beyond the reach of uh, the common man. He also banned, uh, he also banned market associations from fixing prices of food uh, items. I know the federal government is also uh, making efforts, with, especially recently with the establishment of the Ministry of Livestock. This, uh, according to the federal government, is also to uh, improve the whole um, agricultural value chain and ensure that uh, the country uh, gets um, more from uh, this whole um, livestock sector especially um, uh, dairy, beef, and also the uh, leather, leather industry contributes significantly to the country's um, gross domestic uh, product. Well, also, there has been so much happening in the polity, you know. We have already started seeing politicking ahead of 2027, even though some people say it's a distraction that the government should be focused on governance at this time. I will now have joining us um, a lawyer and public affairs analyst, Daniel Boala, joining me via phone. Hello, good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank you for having me. Thanks. We're glad you could join us. Well, so much our politicking has started ahead of um, 2027. We are also seeing uh, moves by uh, people, in all, not just within the opposition now, even within the governing or progressive party, you know, uh, some kind of um, alignment and realignment. We're also hearing the latest uh, defection of the former president of the Senate, Ayi Pius Ayi, from the uh, People's Democratic Party to the All Progressive Congress. All of these are uh, movements, alignment and permutations. Isn't it a distraction from the issue of governance because there are really issues that need to be addressed now in the country and not uh, politicking. Well, uh, thank you for having me. The, 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 the time is the time for governance. And the good thing for us is that President Bola Metinibu is focused on that. Uh, in all of this conversation around uh, politicking, calculation with calculation, you have not, I have not come across any event or any time in which the president got distracted. It is ball players who are uh, probably calculating and miscalculating. Those who want to wrest power from him, or those who want to position themselves for the 2027, or in fact, his style of governance is attracting people. You see, President Bola Metinibu is running a people-centric government, an all-inclusive government. You know, a government that is not necessarily tied by political affiliation but he's looking at the broader picture. And understandably so, because when he took over, uh, when he was uh, sworn in as the president, the situation of Nigeria is one that does not and will not permit for the luxury of politics and uh, uh, divisiveness, right? So our own joy is that the president and commander-in-chief of the armed forces is focused on the principal work ahead of him, which is to deliver to Nigeria an economy that will work for everybody, whether you are the son of a rich man or the son of a poor man, whether you're educated or not educated, he wants to bring the economy to a point where any and every hardworking Nigeria will find path to happiness and success. And that's everything to me. Okay, um, Daniel Buala, you know, some people have said the president, um, with uh, these financial autonomy now granted to the local government, that's the Supreme Court judgment granting, financial autonomy to the local government. Some people have, has, have described that as a master stroke. But, you know, the governors, we have seen their statements commending that judgment, welcoming that judgment. But some people have said, you know, it's grudgingly they do not particularly like the fact that local governments will become independent. And it might also set them up against the president. Do you foresee that? No. Anybody who doesn't welcome the idea of financial autonomy of the local government is anti-democratic and does not want the progress of Nigeria. I think the policy and the moves of the president towards uh, redirecting the country so we can have a full-fledged democracy at work 
is one that will naturally irk and annoy those people who have been used to rent seeking or a system that has not so far allowed the country to move forward. And I'll give you an example. This uh, notion that the governors are going to be up in arms, you know, politically speaking against the president, I think is just a fallacy. A fallacy because you have seen after the Supreme Court decision from every part of Nigeria, especially from the southeastern Nigeria, where people tend to have this thinking that the president is not popular. You see, you have seen video clips of people singing his name and thanking him. Why? Because financial autonomy to the local government is taking government to the foundation. The foundation, that's why in our recent national anthem, we talk about we from every tribe. Because before Nigeria became a nation and a republic, we are all entities in our ethnic nationality. And that was where government and administration was established. If you take your mind back to the pre-colonial era, you see system of administration, local policy, well-established local government system. And then over time, as we became a republic and then we discovered oil, everybody ran away from the primary constituency. Why do you think in politics? They will say to show that you are a political weight person, to us your grassroots. Where is the grassroots? The foundation. Where is the root? The foundation. Where is the constituency? The foundation. Where is where the governor comes from? So the president took that government that people took away to the center right back to where it belongs. And this is where the foundation of insecurity in Nigeria is. This is where the foundation of the lack of education and poor health facility. Do you know, for, for God's sake, that 21 states of the federation are not running a democratically elected administration of local government? And it is a slap on the face of the Constitution. The governors who are against, I'm happy that some are showing excitement, but the governors who are against the local administration, the autonomy of the local government, are governors where if you take a critical look at their state, you will see they probably have the worst local government system in the country. Because 20.3 20, 20 or 4% of the allocation is supposed to go to the local government. But it is co-managed with the 20.6 of the state. When you add, you had about almost 50, yeah, almost 50.1 uh, or so, or thereabout, the states are managing it. And the president, when he began, Permit me to land on this one. When he began, he showed good faith by making sure that states are adequately supported financially. He even added some money to them. But can you tell me from when the president became president to today, the local government in Nigeria, whether there is marked improvement in the healthcare, in the education, even in food security that we're talking about. So it's a welcome development, and the, the entirety of the federation, from what I've been monitoring, are excited with that development. So any government that is not, I think that the government is expo exposing themselves. Well, I think um, they say, some people have said the problem, again, is also because the system or the government at that third tier has not been particularly accountable or held to account, maybe by the state governors, because, you know, monies are uh, distributed from the federal to the state, and then when it gets to that third tier of government, it is no longer accounted for. And that's the pro that is why... Some governors has, have decided to still superintend over the affairs of the local government. And the governors who are superintending over the affairs of the local government, how accountable are they? So it is a case of pointing accusing like fingers at the local government when you have not been able to demonstrate with the increased resources that you have that you have actually delivered accountable government. Take, for example, Shortly before we had the increased allocation, the fear of the government is that they could not meet up with staff salary, they could not meet up with projects, that so many of the states are likely going to are likely bankrupt. The president sat with them and they agreed on the increased formula, but nothing has shown and nothing is seen in those states. The president recently called them, gave them additional 10, 10 billion, nothing is seen. So they are actually, by their inadvertentness, they are putting more of the pressure on the president. You have not been accountable, and you are afraid that the local government chairman will not be accountable. But in all this, I can promise you that with this decision of the Supreme Court, 
the local government chairman are going to be more effective. You know why? When the governor knows the money is not coming to him, he will neither allow the local government chairman to eat, also he will ensure that the local government chairman uses the money for the good of that locality. If that is their argument, it's a baseless argument. If they extend the argument to say there is no well structure of administration, it is also their fault. Even the the candidate of the Labour Party, that's why ever since the decision of the Supreme Court was delivered, he has been quiet and has not been there. You know he's used to grandstanding, and he has not said anything. Do you know why? Throughout his tenure as a governor, he refused to conduct local government administration. So we must clap for President Bola Mechinibu for pushing this agenda to ensure that we deal with the critical problem confronting us as a nation. And by the way, nobody is looking at a day when, by the uh, application of this constitutional provision and the decision of code, that overnight local government chairman are going to be perfect. But whether they are perfect or not, one, president wants to obey the constitution. Two, president wants to ensure that the local, local government see what comes to them from this republic. And then three, they will be able to hold their local government chairman to account. You will find chief council will work. Our uh, traditional leaders are not going to be agents of bandits and terrorists because they are not empowered. We are going to have local vigilantes, well-structured and empowered. We are going to have wild parks. We are going to have the, uh, uh, this uh, healthcare system at the local level. Very, very much. Government is going to go down to the local government. So I don't think that is a worthy argument that the local government chairman are likely is not going to be accountable. It's not All an right. argument that can be sustained. All right, Daniel Boala. You know, people have also um, complained about the way the local government chairmen are elected and are now even advocating for the scrapping of the state's independent electoral commission, saying that INEC, that's at the federal level now, should be uh, charged with conducting election at the third tier of government. Probably just to tinker with um, the constitution and make um, some, some legislations that would empower INEC uh, to carry that out. What's your own take on these um, arguments? I agree with that point 100%. As a matter of fact, that is the political autonomy because if that's the electoral autonomy, if you grant autonomy to the local government because of the interference of the state, you must also ensure that the process by which the chairman emerged must be one that is not still under the clause of the governor. Right? I make as a national body by law, in my view, has the capacity to conduct election. Now, there are a lot of people who have caught it in a constitutional provision that talk about state electoral commission. Fine. There is going to come a time when we talk about the constitutional review process, even though governors are likely going to try to stop it. But I think that the Attorney General, in the same way that he found a local standard to approach the Supreme Court on the matters of financial autonomy of the local government, there are enough provisions in the Constitution and the Electoral Act in order to give effect to the judgment of the Supreme Court and the spirit and the later and intention of the lawmakers, he can still approach the Supreme Court and act whether or not having regard to the provision of the law and the decision of the court in recent days, you know, in Attorney General of the Federation and Attorney General of all the states of uh, Nigeria, whether the National uh, Electoral Commission should not conduct election at the local level. And I believe that since the Supreme Court is a court of law and court of policy, and they have applied the law and policy in the last judgment, they are likely to see that in order to give effect to that their judgment, there is need for the National Electoral Commission to conduct election at the local level, pending when there will be constitutional ad uh, amendment that will clearly spell out uh, the responsibility of Ireland to do that. Well, uh, before I let you go, Daniel Boala, I know you have been in the news uh, trending for saying that you have left the PDP, even though uh, that was not formally announced, your exit from the PDP. You are not yet in the APC, probably still transitioning. But how come you defend a party that you're not uh, a member of? What do you mean? I mean, defending President Bola Metinubu? And his party, the APC, because some people used to say defending President Bola Metinubu means also standing for the party, the APC, and you are not a member of that party. Listen, I have never been ashamed of APC. I've never had a problem with APC. I've never had a problem even with the president in the first place. When I made a decision that time and I left, it was on the basis of the fear that I think that my people are likely going to be marginalized. When the president became president, he killed those fears by 
put into the country a fair and equitable system of government where there is inclusivity and inclusion, right? And I made a commitment to support the president. He's the president of the republic. He's even the president of the, of the opposition, not just APC. But well, I, I, and funny enough, let me be honest with you today, and I want the Nigerian people to be here. You see, it was so fast the time I left APC and I went to PDT. It was so fast that there was no time for me to tender my resignation in APC. Yeah. And when I went into PDT, we immediately went into campaign. Mm. And there was no time for me to register Indeed. as a member of PDT. So technically, I've never left APC. But right. uh, if for the purposes of communication of the public, yeah. I have left PDT. That is a fact. Okay, then. But my coming to APC will be very, very soon. All right, then. Thank you so much, Daniel Boala, lawyer and public affairs uh, analyst. Well, quickly before we go, I should let you know that uh, the special advisor to the president on media and public affairs Adjurin Gilale set a record by churning out the highest number of press statements in a single day from the presidency, 14 in total. Well, just a political trivia, that should count for something.